We're all here to share the gifts that we have been given. And every single person on this planet, every mm -hmm. single one, I don't care who you are or what your circumstances are, you have a gift that you can share with others. And that's how we build the community. Lynette Zhang, welcome so much. It's so good to be talking with you again. It's been too long. We last saw each other. I think that was um one of George Gammon's events, if I remember right. Exactly. Yeah. And we were having such a good time because we were talking about things like community and having a resilience place to maybe go to. And good, those were the good old days when you and I were still talking about things that hadn't yet quite come true for most people. But things are coming true now. And uh, let's start at the top. I, you know what I want? I'm, where do we start? Um, there's gold, there's CBDCs, there's the tokenization of assets, there's the great taking, there's all of this. What's top of mind for you these days? God, the debt wall that we are already running into, right? Mm -hmm. And I learned so much about debt from you. Um, and I think there is the, would you like to talk about the two types of debt, please? Because I sure. think- really important yeah. for people to understand it. They always lump it into one, but there really are two types of debt. Well, there there are, and and it we'll call it good debt, bad debt, you know, to put a value judgment on it, but it's it's technically self-liquidating and non-self-liquidating debt. So good debt is self-liquidating. You, you, you expand your restaurant, you invest in something, maybe even in yourself and your own education, and that gives you higher earning potential. Self-liquidating debt comes with the means of earning its own money back. And that's fine. That's good stuff, right? Um, people use it in real estate. It, it's good debt. Bad debt is, um, you know, putting it all on the credit card and going to Vegas and blowing it all and coming back with nothing to show for it, right? Um, now, now you just got to pay that back. So those are the two types. And then the other thing I want to talk to you about is people often just focus, and I don't know why, just on the federal debt. But we passed a huge milestone in the last, you know, report out of Federal Reserve. Total credit market debt in the United States. That student loans, corporate, federal, all of it. Over $100 trillion now. Plus all the direct on top of it. Do we really know how big that debt bomb is? Nope. We don't. Where's the risk? If, if you ask that, I've asked so many professionals like, where is the risk? Do I know what it is? I haven't gotten an answer yet that, that feels right to me. Well, I, I agree. And, you know, when we're looking at this debt wall, and you said so many people just look at the federal debt, you talked about the debt levels being super high, but what about all this corporate debt and those zombie corporations with, you know, that were enabled to grow exponentially more debt because the banks didn't want to show the losses on their books and what's happening to them now as they're hitting the debt wall. Well, we're, we're experiencing a math problem, right? It's just, it, it's just, listen, we just have a math problem at this point. And we know, we know that with this math problem, there's an eventual hard stop date where, you know, right. interest payments are exceeding income. That's a zombie company. But that's going to happen for the federal government at some point where interest payments alone will exceed income tax receipts, right? And then what? Well, that's your math problem. You never quite get fully to the math problem way before then. The creditors begin to walk away and then they run away. I think we're getting close to that moment. Yeah, I, I think I think we are too. And I, it's funny because you don't really see it. They aren't really talking about it. They are talking about the sticky inflation and therefore the higher for longer interest rates. But what does that mean for you or to you, really? Well, uh, you know, I struggle with this because I th Luke Groman helped clarify it for me where he said, look, it, it's, you know, we're down to that razor's edge, right? There's two things the Fed can do. They can either defend the currency or the debt market, right? What do you do? So if they defend the dollar, that's one course of action, or maybe they defend the bond market. So what does that mean? We all know the Fed's been doing a little QT, little that's what they say, uh, winding down their balance sheet. But then if the federal government has to auction another $2 trillion, you know, and throw that out the door, and there are no buyers for that, the Fed will step in and buy that, right? They, right. they have to. Yeah. 
And, and so that's defending the bond market. But when they do that, they then just print all this money up and throw it out the door. And, and so that makes the dollar go, you know, and that's so what do they, so I think they're stuck in those, in that spot, you know, what do we do? And so and what we're seeing, I'll tell you what makes me really nervous at this point, and I wanted to get your opinion on it, is, you know, since 2008 and up until 2015, um, when the first shocker came, we've watched a synchronized global central bank move to, I don't know whether it's really, I think it's just to postpone it for the in inevitable shift into the new currency, but it was Switzerland two times now in 2015. Remember, they had that, they swore to that peg to the euro, to the euro, Swiss franc to the euro, and then they broke that peg, and they were the first advanced economy to lower interest rates. So something that concerns me a lot is the now where we were synchronized, we're bifurcated in the global central bank's move to raise or lower the interest rates, and it feels to me like that's the ground shifting underneath our feet. Do you have you do you have an opinion on that or what you see happening from that? Oh, it's a good question and, and I've been I've been pounding the table on this for a while, but it might be a little too wonkish. But um see my problem, Lynette, is that I learned how all this worked pre two thousand eight <laughs> and nine. And then they changed the rules on me. So can I do this so old school? Prior to 2009, when the Fed raised or lowered interest rates, it didn't have a dial it turned. It had to go and reach into the market and pull cash out, and that would make interest rates float up between banks on the overnight lending. Conversely, they want rates to go down. They start throwing cash back into the market, and it makes the rate go down. So the, the interest rate was sort of a target that they were going after, and they would have to watch it carefully and just be pushing and taking cash in and out. Hose 2009, in Bernanke's genius, you know, what do they do now? Now they turn the little dial. They pay, they pay something called interest on excess reserves. They just set it. And so now when the Fed tightens, it raises interest. It doesn't, it's not withdrawing cash from the market. So this shocked me when I saw just this past week, because I'm like, look, stocks were really tanking. Bonds were tanking in October of 23, November, mm -hmm. everything turns around, scalded ape, up into the right, 45 degree ramp. What's going on? It turns out that right now, financial conditions are easier than yep. they have been since even the height of the covid insanity four and a half trillion right yep. easy and they're talking oh should we raise should we pause should we lower i'm like who cares exactly <laughs> who cares <laughs> it's irrelevant so we're all navel gazing are they going to raise or lower but it's it's like a dog whistle that doesn't connect to anything to me because it doesn't matter Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I saw the same thing. You just go into the Fred's economic conditions and they never got really tight because, I mean, one of the things is what you were saying, but what does that mean? If you know you're going to go bankrupt, does it matter if you take on more debt? And it's like pushing on a string with this sticky inflation. The big conundrum that I've had, and just like you ask lots of people, the big question that I keep asking, and they look at me like deer in headlights, is what happens when the purchasing power gets to zero? Because this is a con game. It requires confidence, right? And mm -hmm. we're even officially awfully close to that zero level in terms of purchasing power anyway. Yeah. And so here, here's why. So, uh, you know, I've been concerned about this stuff for a while because math problems are what they are. <laughs> where right. all of this changed for me was was February 28th, 2022, when the United States fully weaponized the dollar and said to Russia, your sovereign reserves are not sovereign and they're not reserves. We're seizing them. Well, freezing them, but now seizing them. Right. And in that moment, Lynette, I, I, I can't wait to hear what you say about this, because I'm I've been watching the gold market like a hawk. And it's always it's just this boring, you know, comex paper game thing. And but for decades, the inverse of real interest rates and gold tracked each other mm -hmm. perfectly and then right in 2022 they just broke apart from each other right and then i'm on the phone with with people i know who who run refineries in switzerland and all this stuff and even bloomberg will tell you it's that west to east gold flow is a hemorrhage right yep. and it really is picking up steam in 2022 but now of late 
I think 125,000 ish kilo bars went from Switzerland to Hong Kong alone. Um, just gone, right? 125 tons. I, did, have you, like, I'm seeing things, and maybe I'm just seeing, making patterns where they shouldn't, but I think I'm seeing things I've never seen before in the gold market. Yep. You have way more experience in it than I do. Um, what are you seeing? Well, I don't know that I have more experience than you do because I've awful, I've learned an awful lot from you. But yes, what I'm seeing is a huge shift. And I think that the reason why, and, and e e even the headlines of, wow, we've never seen this before. We've never seen this before. Could it possibly yeah. be because we are at the end of this currency's <laughs> life cycle? And so things aren't like they were before. And the tools that the Fed had or the global central bankers have, they're just gone. And when you talk about that shift of gold from the West, so from this area over to the East, to China, to the BRICS nations, they're building an entire financial infrastructure based on this new form of money. And I don't think there'll be one country that's going to control it. I think it'll come out of the IMF. But what happens when that system, when they feel that that system is ready and they've tested it, they can just turn that one spigot on and turn the swift spigot, the U.S. system off. Well, and then what do we do? Right. <laughs> so the the Fed, the Fed is going to I don't see I, I've thought this through as hard as I can and I can't see. We'll get to CBDCs in a second, but but the Fed is going to have to back there's no way you could be in a world of just printing federal reserve notes willy nilly when you have two thirds of the world's economies all trading on some sort of a hard asset backed currency. Because if I have a choice, I'm putting all my money on the backed currency and I'm not keeping any over here. And that, right. that, that's it. That's, that's the end of the world's reserve currency status as a reserve currency. I mean, it's, I don't, so the fed will have to, they'll finally have competition, which they always needed. <laughs> and this will make them straighten up and fly right, but with a hundred trillion in debt on the books, oh, how does that work? Well, I wish I could believe that was only a hundred and, and well, what it, what it, how does that work? Is a huge hyperinflationary depression that crushes everything so that they can start over anew. But I'm hoping, and I know this is this is an area that you and I definitely coincide with with the community piece. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm hoping that we can create a quiet revolution simply by shifting from this fiat garbage into sound money. That that's where I believe we really, really have to go uh, in order to do it. And I think that's why you see the East buying so much gold, right? Because whoever holds the sound money, real money that holds its purchasing power is going to retain their freedom and their options and their power. I agree. You know, uh, this this has been settling on me in the last year or so, because, you know, I've been a big critic of debt-based fiat money, because it has a math problem built in, but it also has a human problem built in, which is you really can't trust humans. They, they need guardrails, <laughs> and it's right. just how it is, right? And so uh, as I look at this, I realize, you know what, Lynette, it's that, Everything that we're facing right now, we had this horrifying COVID response. We've got this horrifying, you know, foreign policy stuff, and we're just throwing generations under the bus. Nobody cares about yep. anything anymore. All this stuff, right? It's all corrupt. It's massive yep. corruption. So, but how do you have a non-corrupt society built on a corrupt money system? Because that's what a debt-based fiat money system is. When the Federal Reserve clickety clacks a trillion out of thin air and hands it to J.P. Morgan, they've handed a trillion of honest to God, real purchasing power to somebody. But where did that come from? Well, it came dishonestly because there was no work involved. So it's a dishonest money system. And now we're over here saying, could we elect the right person? Is there any tweaks? Like, what could we do? I'm like, you can't. It's unfixable. Yeah, I, I'm with you 100% right there. And I think that that's a lot of what we're seeing is it is not flexible, uh, fixable. We have to go into a new system. The question is, are we going to allow the guys that got us into this position to begin with remain in charge in that new system? Or, you know, I mean, I'm really thinking that there are more of us than there are of them. And if we come together, we can have a quiet revolution, which is really 
what I'm seeing around the world, and particularly in China, you know, with their lay down generation, it's the youth of the world that create these revolutions, right? And they're simply saying, nope, not going to do it. Don't believe in what you said. So, you know, so I'm not going to do it. But at the same time, this gives me so much hope. We're watching these young people pile into gold as well, starting to pile into gold. Yep. Well, that, that's a great thing because because I have, I have my little tubes of of the good stuff too. Um, and I love I like your bags. Yeah, I like uh, playing so, sounds, you know. Yeah, I do. <laughs> nice, nice sounds. Um, well, I mean, just think about so so. Imagine uh, that you know our our we take our best and our brightest and then we push them into these nonsensical situations and, and some of them have to just check out cause they just don't make sense. Right. So it was only, I think a couple months ago that Harvard finally said, well, we won't require vaccinations for our students. Right. And there was zero reason to require COVID vaccinations for, for people of that age and general health zero, right. but there was a lot of risk. So they were saying to our young, if you want to come and be part of our system, we're going to make you potentially lose your life so that we feel a little bit better about things. How's that? Right. I'm like, that's not very inspiring. No, you know, not, not super motivated by that. And then, and then they're like, well, this whole plagiarism thing, it's, it's hard. It's kind of hard to, you know, yeah, the president plagiarized a lot of stuff, but you know, she's a black woman. So what are you going to do? You know, it's like, not that bad. I mean, it's just like, you know, <laughs> it's just, right. It just doesn't make sense on any level. And of course, it, if you're a smart kid, you have to look at that and go, wow, this does not pencil out. Something is something's really wrong in this story, you know? You know, and you're you're talking about the higher institutions. I don't want to get into too far what they're what's happening right now, because I don't like what I'm seeing at all. But, you know, the assumption is, is that that. These higher institutions, especially a place like Harvard, is supposed to teach you how to think, right? Not just memorize stuff, but actually how to question and think about things and go more deeply in it. But their their actions do not support their words, do they? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, you know, there's um, one of the most important pieces of parenting advice I got from somebody because the discussion was, you know, how do you teach morals, values? And the answer was, you don't. You model them. Exactly. Exactly. So Harvard that, can have all the ethics classes it wants, but it's not <laughs> modeling them. So it's just empty time. Well, unfortunately, I think that we're seeing a lot of that throughout society, just not in the higher education, but throughout society. And I think that's one of the reasons. Well, I know that's one of the indications that we are at the end of this system's life cycle. And you recently did a video that you're seeing signs of collapse all around. What mm -hmm. signs are you seeing? Oh, you know, it, it's, it's so, so many. many dimensions, so many, where do we go? But one of the ones that bothers me probably the most, um, and, and again, I learned a very important lesson at one point, somebody who I was speaking about, you know, the justice system, I'm a Virgo, I like things all fair and balanced and everything. And, and uh, they said, you know, justice is a middle-class perception, right? The poor know better, the rich know better. Well, now everybody knows better, right? Because we've watched the collapse of our judiciary as a, as a fair and balanced, impartial system, and it's just off the reservation. I don't even want to call it third world, because I think third world nations aren't as bad as what I've been seeing of late. So watching that collapse has been really you know what the next step after that is? It's just anarchy because why should, why should I obey stop signs or, you know, these other laws when we watch what's going on with what Fauci just did committed an open conspiracy evading FOIA. It's on the books, right? Title 18, section 1001 broke the law. Clearly. Is the justice department going to do anything? Probably not. Right. We know probably he's probably not. not, you know, part of the protected class, you know, um, and then you look at no bankers going to jail after 2008-9 and, you know. So the appearance and the reality of, of law are important for holding the society together. So we're clearly in a pretty advanced stage of collapse mm -hmm. when we can't operate 
two of the most basic fundamental tenets of having what we call a democracy, and I'm using air quotes for anybody just listening, we don't have verifiable election systems, and I'm using that word very carefully, verifiable, and we don't have a, a fair and honest uh, ju judiciary system anymore. Right. That's a slippery slope. Very slippery slope and definitely a sign of collapse. What other signs are you seeing? Ooh, well, um, we got the Japanese yen. We could always talk about what <laughs> it's getting frisky over there, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. We, we've got, we've got, uh, I think that the U.S. 10 year market is, is also showing some stuff. We've got gold and silver. I've never seen, like, I can't believe. So I wake up this morning, Lena, and I, I look and, and there's somehow mysteriously right around eight o'clock and also at two o'clock in the morning, somebody starts selling paper or silver on, on Globex, right? And yep. then on Comex. But over there at the SGE, their closing figure was 36 bucks an ounce. We're at 32 an ounce. Is arbitrage even a thing anymore? Like, how does, you know, how, how do you square that? Well, so that, that's a pressure that that's that represents just grotesque over pressure in the system as they try and maintain the paper appearance, which they've done for my whole adult life. But I think I'm seeing the early stage of losing that. That's what that's, you know, buildings outside of 9-11 don't just fall down all at once. Right. It's a sort of a there's a progressive sort of a collapsing. I think that's what we're seeing in the financial markets right now. That's really interesting. And I want to talk a little bit more about that because um, that's really significant. But I wanted also, you know, you mentioned the Japanese yen and earlier you mentioned the dollar, right? Stronger or weaker. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I honestly think that that is just an illusion because when they talk about the strong dollar, does it mean that it really buys you more stuff? Or it's just stronger against another currency while they're all on a race to have zero value in terms of the ability to purchase. I mean, I've got a hundred trillion dollars Zimbabwe note. I can't even buy three eggs with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's what that's yeah. what really matters. So, you know, the Japanese yen. Boy, Japan has been a leader in in showing us how to make things appear well by, you know, buying up all their bonds, buying up all their stocks. We're doing the same thing though. So, you know, really what's the difference? Japan is the one that introduced the zombie companies and we just followed through and all of their alphabet soup on how to control the yield curve and, and, you know, all of this stuff. And it's just garbage because since the 90s, has any of that really worked? No, I think what Japan reveals to us, Lynette, is the extent to which um, we have a really bad model that's operating. And so the Japanese central bankers have done everything they can to sort of pr maintain the system. But I think they forgot the point, which is that the economy money system is there is a medium of exchange to support what the people need. Right. Should, isn't it about the people? Right. It's not about the banking system. It should be about the people yeah right so they have an aging population which is going to consume less right and they have a declining population due to a variety of factors right and and so those are the realities so in fact what they need is a declining economy to sort of map into what the people need because they've made some decisions as a culture this is how we're going to roll right in terms of you know immigration or, or no immigration being allowed etc fine but the bank over here of japan has been saying oh no we have to have more constant growth all the time and so that's the tension it's been growing like crazy and they've they the average debt per household in japan is way over a million bucks right so how are they going to pay that back because ultimately it's a household that ultimately always pays the debt back right corporations are made up of people who live in households and they sell their products to people who live in households and etc right so japan i think is the poster child for how to continue to run a system for its own sake and forgetting why you were running the system in the first place. Wow. Wow. Well, do you think any, do you think any at least advanced, no, I mean, do you think there's, if, can you name one government out there that understands that they're supposed to be supporting the people and not themselves? El Salvador and possibly Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not sure I want to go live in either one of those places, but, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And so you see them, the powers that be, the central banks, the governments losing control. Well, yeah, they're going to for math reasons. Um, I don't again, I don't think we get to math before we get to some other situation first. Right. So how do they, you know, how does how do you go broke? Right. Slowly, then all at once. And so I feel like that all at once stage is coming. Now, the United States that we know about has well north of $10 trillion of petrodollars floating around out there, right? I think it's a lot higher because you got the Mark Skidmore, you know, saying, well, there's 22 trillion of unaccounted for government spending. And I'm like, well, where is that money? And then you had your Panama Papers, which said, I don't know, but this one little law firm in Panama had thousands of accounts. And I looked through those accounts when they came out, Lynette, and I was like, I don't know any of these names, right? I, like, who are all these people that have all this wealth that they have to start tucking it offshore in U.S. dollars. Like it was a mysteri mysterious thing to me, right? And now we know they're, they probably belong to, you know, they probably, a lot of them have .gov email addresses, I'm willing to bet. Um, so uh, just to guess. But so the chances are that there's actually trillions and trillions of dollars that we know about and don't know about offshore that if, if all of a sudden we're going to get to this a new stage, a person just explained this to me, uh, very well connected in the gold space, said to me, Chris, we're about to get to this new stage where the wealthy, the family office types, are going to go from wealth creation to wealth preservation. And when they make that mental shift, right, and now all of a sudden they are not worried about am I in NVIDIA and how much Microsoft do I have and all that. They're worried about how do I not lose what I got? Right. And that's right. when I think we get to the mad scramble. And the thing I'm desperately trying to alert people to, and I, I know you are too, is please, please, please take this seriously because this is a before and after story. You can buy gold today. You can buy silver today. I guarantee you, you wake up one day and you just can't because 25 family offices said we're, we're throwing down and we're going to a 25% weighting in this stuff and it's all over. Like there's none, none left to buy. Yeah, that, that makes a whole lot of sense because this does, this is proven. I mean, look at look at what the Bank for International Settlements said in the gold's role in the currency markets. It's the only, only financial asset that runs at no counterparty risk. Everything else, exactly, no counterparty risk. So I do agree with you and I'm seeing this surge. This is what's giving me a lot of hope. You know, all around the world. I mean, in the U.S., for Walmart, Costco, and Amazon yeah. to be selling gold and silver and for the public to go in and snap that up, and we're seeing the same kind of behavior in China. We're seeing the same kind of behavior in South Korea. We're seeing the same kind of behavior. This is what, this is really what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm hopeful. I don't know that this is so. I'm just hopeful that that revolution has already begun because it's going to get very nasty out there really quickly. And that takes us really to why you and I have both done sustainable farms and, and off-grid properties, food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community arguably has become the most important part and shelter and all of the subcategories in there. You know, I've been working on my little urban farm since 2010. When did you start yours? Well, we moved. So we've started on this right in 2020. Okay. So that's, and, and that was uh, 2021 was when I got my bug out location. Because I saw the whole, you're already bugged out. You know, you're really far away with lots of land around you. Um, I was in dead central Phoenix. And I and I mean, I still am. And I put in a tremendous amount of security. But I pulled all the grass and planted food because food becomes the single biggest issue for mm -hmm. most people as we make these transitions from one system to the other system. I'd have to say my biggest fear that I have is that we do not have a say in the new financial system, that it becomes even more onerous. And, you know, you talked about the middle class. Well, the middle class almost doesn't exist anymore, right? They've been working on destroying that 
since the 2000s, right? Early 2000s. So, I mean, what happens to those people that don't have the foresight to get prepared and make sure that you have security in all of those areas? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, so... Well, it, I know this that... feels in, this feels intentional to me, right? And, and here's why: because I... wasn't it Lenin who said, you know, he, here's how communists would destroy capitalism, right? It's very simple, right? First, you destroy as much as you can through inflation, and that eats its way all the way up, and then you do taxation, and that nibbles most of the way up through, and then you finally pull the plug in deflation, and all those ultra wealthy who thought they were safe over there in their assets, now that's all gone. And so that's how you do it. You just knock those legs out one at a time, right? So the inflation, obviously higher than advertised. Obviously, they lie about it on purpose. That's intentional, right? Mm -hmm. um, they do it with statistics. We all know it's worse than, than advertised, right? You know, right. who hasn't like walked out now with a small cart of stuff for 500 bucks from the grocery store, right? You know, who, who believes that that health costs have only gone up 0.1% in the past year like they're trying to claim? <laughs> I'd right. like to send them my insurance bill and say, please adjust this to point one, you know, increase this yeah. year. And um, but then we saw this shocked me. My eyebrows went all the way up, you know, and they have to go far to find my hairline. So oh, way up there. <laughs> did you see what did you make of Biden? Team Biden, not him. He's obviously senile. But I mean, Team Biden decided in an election year, the right thing to do would be to announce this huge capital gains proposed tax increase. <laughs> to levels never before seen and take out the oil and gas depletion allowance stuff. So that's oil and oh, the 1031 exchange. Let's take out real estate. Oh, and corporate taxes should go up. Who who lines up their major donors against the brick wall in an election year? Except somebody who doesn't care. Yep. I mean, how did you interpret that? How do I interpret that? I, yeah. Well, I think the collapse is going is being engineered, and I agree with you. I think what they're trying to do is a controlled implosion so that they can maintain their power on the other side of the implosion. But we got to have it, you know. And when you're looking at, I mean, honestly, Keynesian economics is absolutely flipping genius. I mean, it is because they create that inflation and then they tax that inflation, which makes it even worse. I mean. It's genius, evil genius. But what do you do when it's all over? Yeah. Because this is a con game. And I think they I think they realize that it is over. I think they know it and they want to control that implosion so that they remain in power. And I say, let's take our power back. This is our opportunity. Let's do it. But you got to have you got to know where your food's coming from. Right. Because the oh. chance of them. So so here's the thing. If honestly, Lynette, if this was like a bunch of people who who had just come out of jobs in trucking, farming, welding, like they had some connection to real work output again. Mm -hmm. right? But these all these people making their fancy McKinsey PowerPoint slide decks. Here's how we're going to control the implosion. They're like so far removed from reality. They lived in this abstract yeah. world. And I don't think they understand how things actually work. And my concern is it's a complex system. They're going to try and control collapse it. And it's going to get away from them yeah. and it's going to collapse, collapse, and then not do at all what they thought. And everybody ends up poorer and sadder. And, oh, that sounds like socialism and communism, you know, <laughs> like, except for every except time. Some. Right. Those that are have some foresight and get into the proper position, because all the wealth that that there is in the world, it doesn't disappear. It just shifts location. How about mm -hmm. if we have it for a change, shift our way? A wealth just a, transfer. Just to be on the right side of the transfer, right? Exactly. For yeah. me, that's what the gold does because they suppress the price, even, even at these levels, even with all of their fancy tricks. But I'm watching, you know, the ETF flow in and out of the gold ETFs and the silver ETFs. But specifically, I'm, I'm thinking, because I see the chart in my mind, of the gold ETF flow. That used to be a mechanism to control the price, but it's not working lately. What the hey? 
the ETFs have been bleeding gold, but the, everybody else has been gobbling it up. And it's like, hmm, are they losing control? Is the paper market, because the last time I think that I actually saw something real about that was at the Bank for International Settlements, the gold derivatives, before they changed the accounting. So again, it goes back to math. But it was 62,000 ounces. And I saw it myself with my own eyes. Unfortunately, I didn't understand, know the print screen button at that time. But I saw with my own eyes, 62,000 ounces of derivative gold, of gold that does not nor ever will exist to one physical ounce. Are they losing? 62,000. Wow. Yeah. And that was, I think, 2009. Because... Prior to 2008, when you would go into the Bank for International Settlements where they track the derivatives, you didn't really have a whole lot of participation, a little bit, but not a whole lot of participation by the central banks. Now, after that period of time, now we've got full participation in the derivative market by the central banks. But I, and so, of course, we want to hide what's really happening because, you know, God forbid the public should know and be able to make some educated choices to protect their best interest. I mean, that'd be terrible. Of that, that'd be terrible. But yeah, sixty thousand yeah. ounces, and you know, we were talking about the interest wow. on the debt, and you might understand this better than I do, but you know, when you go into the Fed debt at the Fred. And you go behind the scenes to the spreadsheets, which anybody can do. When you look at the deficits that we were running, and even back in 2008, 2009, or, or even today, I don't know where they happen to be at this moment. But let's say you're running $2 trillion in deficits, and yet we're servicing, what, $34 trillion in debt? Can you explain to me how that works? Because it looked to me like it was the compounding interest on the debt. That was making our debt explode even more than the willy-nilly spending that we're doing. Yeah, and and um, it, there's always been an accounting problem where they say, "Oh, our deficit was 1.36 trillion last year." I'm like, "Well, then why did the debt go up by 1.9?" Like, exactly. Like, what happened here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they have an accounting problem. That's just cash basis accounting, not accrual basis, which means. What are actual liabilities, Medicare, Social Security, all this and that, right? And I remember it was years ago, um, John Malden was was uh, on a panel with me and somebody had asked him a question like, are you worried about Social Security? He goes, oh, no, no, I'm not worried about it. Why would I worry about Social Security? It'll never be paid. You know, nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point, except that we have this. And isn't this a convenient way to get rid of it? But the world has a retirement crisis that is already unfolding. And, you know, if we have the whole system collapse, boy, that'll justify not doing anything. I mean, yeah. Social security. Yeah, well, it, Pardon? Have, have you, and, and I, I got to tie this thread in because I got to make sure we get there because it's so juicy for me. I've spent a lot of time looking into David Rogers Webb's The Great Taking, right? And I've gone really right. deep in and, you know, torn apart all of the references and it's a thing. Um, I'm wondering, uh, what what you think about that and 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 here's the framing idea I've, i here's where i've come to after a lot of study i don't think that whole thing you'll own nothing and be happy i don't think they actually want to own anything like that i think they want to control it though mm -hmm. and that's where i know you've talked recently about the tokenization of assets so if my mortgage i mean sorry if my if my title on my house gets tokenized i've lost control of that in some important respect haven't i Yes, you have. And I mean, the way that they've trained us is to hold all of our equity on our phone. And we are nudged, official term, not mine, nudged mm -hmm. to spend our equity. I mean, I've seen way too many people in the middle class that have owned responsibility for their failure when, quite honestly, the government, the central bank set them up for failure. But when you spend all your equity, you're not going to point a finger at somebody behind the scenes that's manipulating you. And so, you know, I think that they, that I do think that this will be controlled by the IMF, 
who is coming out with a world coin. And that's, that's the most logical one to me because they can put every currency in there. So you can have this global one world global currency at the same time that you can have the individual local currency so that people don't think that anything has changed. But the tokenization of all of the assets, the IMF a while ago said that they wanted to control that. And yeah, whoever controls the title to your house or any of the equity that you have in that house on top of, of the title, all of a sudden it's owned by an investor in China or somewhere else. So I do see the wealth transfer via tokenization that people really won't understand what's happening and blindly fall into that trap because they have to have that new boat or they have to have whatever it is that they have to have um, or they feel that they need to have because of all of this short-termism, right? We've been trained, hey, if this happened 15, past 15 seconds ago, it's irrelevant. When you need that distance to be able to see what's happening and you need to understand what's happening in order to make educated choices that actually put your best interest first. So yeah, the tokenization, I can see some good of it if you're aware and you too can take advantage of that, but the masses, they won't see it. The public how, won't how, see it. How could we take advantage of it? What do you see there? Well, if they if if assets are tokenized and somebody in China can buy an asset or a piece of an asset in the U.S., that means that the individuals can also do that, mm. right? So, yep. but you're going to have to have purchasing power in order to do that, and that's where the gold and silver comes in. So, if things are pushed through, and and they are, I mean, systems have to evolve, technology evolves. We just need to make sure that we have ourselves in a position to take advantage of it rather than that technology taking advantage of you. Well, I along that line, I, again, the operative word that sort of I'm hanging a lot under now is control, right? So yes. under COVID, they didn't care what was right or wrong. You know, it didn't matter that, you know, having Not old immune. people die alone in the hospital wasn't right, or maybe people should be on the beaches, or maybe we shouldn't allow Target to be open while we close the little mom and pop diner. None of that mattered. What they wanted was the control. That was exciting. Get to lock you in your house and this business has to close, but these can stay open. They like their control. So, yeah. so I see all of this stuff you're talking about, um, the tokenization, the dark side of that to me is going to be, here's, here's my dystopian nightmare, right? A CBDC attached to a social credit score comes out uh -huh. and I've been a very bad boy on Twitter, right? I routinely yep. do not toe the, the official narrative line and say sweet things about Anthony Fauci. Right. And so, um, yeah, that feels like that feels like a very bad outcome to me if we oh, get there. A hundred percent. I mean, there's no doubt that we have to be as independent and self-sufficient as we possibly can, because that is the only way that we can have a voice, period. But one person can't. I mean, because I've had the foresight to and you have as well to build a bug out location that is completely off grid, that is growing food and 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 we have a group of people that can sustain us. All that's great for us, but I feel an obligation, I feel a huge obligation to help as many people as possible get into that same position and come together in community. That that's the I love the event that you do, you know, I think you do it every year where you bring people onto your farm and they get to learn real life skills and and learn and you have to invite me to <laughs> one of these days. That's, you are invited. <laughs> You know, this one, we're actually not doing it on our farm this year. Same concept, but we w needed more facilities because, you know, a lot of people showing up. So we're doing it in Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire in September, September 13th to the 15th. And oh. a good leaf season, right? It's a beautiful time of the year. You are beautiful. more than invited. Um, and this year, you know what we're going to do? Uh, have you ever heard about the Bayesian thing that they ran to find the scorpion, the sub, you know, back in the, in like, they lost a nuclear sub. The military, like one day it didn't show up at port and like where it is, right? Nuts. And it's somewhere they think in the Atlantic and they don't know and they're looking for it. And there's all these different experts, you know, with their opinions. 
and they couldn't find it. So they brought everybody into a room and then they ran a Bayesian experiment, which is everybody had a weighting, a probability, and, and they all put their probabilities together, all these experts, and then they summed them and they said, we'll start looking here. And that's right where it was, right? So I trust that collective intelligence. We can all think and overthink and rethink, but there's this other intuit, there's this other thing and I actively, this sets me apart from the authoritarians. I trust my fellow humans, and I think together we're smarter. And so what we're going to do is we're going to run this exercise where we're going to put two things, a continuum, Mad Max to nothing at all happens, and then timing. Tomorrow, maybe 10 years or whatever. And we'll have everybody sort of self-assemble onto a map, and then we'll find out where the center point of that is as a starting point to have our conversations about what do you do next? And, uh, you know, what should you prepare for? So, so that's kind of, I'm really excited to run this, run this experiment. That sounds absolutely fascinating. I don't know if I can do it this year because I may be with George Gammon on a uh, quest and on an adventure, but if I'm oh, not, that sounds fun. it's, it, it is, I mean, I, I really, I really want to do it because any of his adventures are phenomenal. Um, but and where is he talking about going? Istanbul. Istanbul. So I have never been to okay. Istanbul. I think it would be beyond fascinating to be mingling with everybody and learning what it is in there. But I'm I'm if if I can be assured that it's safe that I can get in there and leave, I'm going. If not, well, I might not be going. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, that's a hotbed area of the world right now. It makes me a little well, sure. I'm, it makes me a little nervous. Well, what 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 doesn't make us all nervous at this point? You know, what makes me nervous is I, I have people who in my I have a large network of people I tap into because I, I like that collective consciousness thing. So I've mm -hmm. got these people who are sort of politically oriented, spiritually oriented, you know, Christians, Jews, Muslims, right? You know, and religious people. We've got um hippies and you know on and on and and uh you add it all up and lynette i got a lot of people telling me like august september they're worried you know oh and i don't know what to make of that yet except i tend to kind of doesn't mean something's gonna happen but i think there's a high probability of the, the probability field is now weighted for something like how do we even make it to an election are really are we gonna how are we really gonna run with biden harris is that the plan here uh you know I don't even know that the election matters. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I, I think we are moving forward in a very de decisive way into a massive crisis. And I think it's just who's going to drive the bus into that crisis. I don't think any elected official, I think they're just there to legalize the theft. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. wish I could feel differently, uh, but I don't, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. No, uh, I'm, I'm with you. I, I do think it's largely figurehead kind of stuff, but the, the tensions, I mean, this could really begin to break the country because let's say we do have an election. Half the country's bitterly disappointed and the other half is bitterly disappointed, no matter how that falls. No matter how it falls. Mm hmm. It, it's true. Are they disappointed enough to make some better choices for themselves? Can they see through what is right in front of their face that is to you and me so obvious. And, you know, that brings up another point though, Chris, which is there's a core of people that definitely understand what's happening and are making those preparations. And you and I are part of that. There's a, a larger contingency that goes, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear mm -hmm. it. Right. And I've run into some people that have said, well, if they don't get it, that's just too bad for them. But I don't feel that way. I feel like what we're asking people to do in here is make a major paradigm shift and believe that what we've been taught since the day we were born is a big fat lie. And therefore, those of us that have the ability to see what's happening, have a responsibility mm -hmm. to help those that cannot, because that's the only way. I mean, when the collapse starts to happen, you know, we're, we're not at the, at the absolute conversion level yet. When this first collapse 
really happens. It's going to scare a lot of people. Maybe, just maybe, those people that, that you know, tried to close their ears and their eyes to ignore it and thinking that it would go away, maybe that will open their eyes and we can have a large, a large enough contingency if we that understand it stay open to helping those people. How do you feel about that? Well, that's exactly the plan I'm on. You know, um, I, I have, there's two ways people change, Lynette, right? Pain and insight, right? You get the heart mm -hmm. attack, you finally get serious about the diet. You back over your third dog, maybe you look into your drinking, right? So pain is one method and it's tried and true and we all change by pain. But we have this other option, which is to change by insight, right? Go to Tony Robbins and get gathered insight learn from other people, see how they do it, and just, you know, don't have to make all the entrepreneur mistakes. There's lots of ways we can do that. So I'm trying to wake people up and say, listen, we can do this by insight, right? And and mm -hmm. it's 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 surprisingly hard, but there are people who are built for it. And what I'd like to see uh, from you, get from you is, if you're seeing what I'm seeing, which is, this was maybe a fraction of a single percent when I started this work 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know, just Myers-Briggs, INTJs, INFJs, just like a very small subset of people who are like built a certain way. And that's fine. Um, I think we're, we're approaching that tipping point where I'm seeing people wake up in droves now, right? They don't know what to do necessarily, but they're on to the idea that this story is broken. Yeah, that, that I, I am right there with you. And that's so much of my work is trying to reach those people and give them some guidance, give them some foundation, help them get prepared and feel, you know, safer. But that community piece locally is absolutely critical if you want to eat and have all of those mantra pieces feel security in there. I mean, that's really critical because if you're hungry and you're hopeless, then you're going to make choices you would not otherwise make. And mm -hmm. if you're completely dependent upon the system, right, and all your wealth is held inside of the system and intangible assets, when that whole thing implodes, you don't know what to do. And I do agree. I'm seeing it grow. I think that's what we're seeing with the Walmarts of the world and the South Koreans and, and even the Chinese that are the most controlled uh, country. That's, I agree with you. I think that that awareness is definitely blooming. I think that they, that a lot of people might not know the direction to go in yet. And so our reach and doing this together and working together, that's the, that's the hope that we have. So locally, but then also globally, because one country can't make this shift. I know Zimbabwe is trying real hard. I mean, I don't know mm -hmm. that I trust the government. I don't know that any of the people that live there actually trust that the gold is, is there because you can't convert it. I mean, you know, I think before I really trust that this whole piece is done, you're going to have to be able to convert whatever that new currency is, whatever that percentage is into gold um, and, and take it out of the system. Because if you don't, doesn't mean anything, in my opinion. You know, maybe I'm wrong. But yeah, I do see a collective growing awareness. And if we can come at this part from a global level and start positioning into hard assets as well as all of the other things, you know, I mean, call me crazy, but I want to see it at the table. I want to make sure that for our mm -hmm. children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, at least they're starting out in a system of sound money. I'm not saying 100%, but something that creates a level of responsibility and restriction from absolute power. Because right now, they can do this as much as they want. And there's <laughs> no restriction on it. And every time they do it, whatever is out there loses all of that purchasing power value. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. I, I, you know, my, my, my mission at my company is creating a world worth inheriting. And I can't say we've done all that good of a job at that so far, but, but that's really where we're it, This has to be about what we're leaving behind and we're leaving behind a mess and that's not okay. I'm not okay with that personally. 
right? So, so what do we do about that? But I'm, I'm, I'm really becoming quite Ludwig von Mises, a Hayek kind of a person. I'm, I'm just, I'm really defaulting back. And it comes down to this foundational idea that we talked about before, which is I want a sound society, which means we need sound money. Yep. It's that simple. It really is that simple. And I've been quite heartened with what I've been seeing happening at the state level. I think it needs to happen faster. But, you know, uh, so so I'm putting it out there that I'm getting more involved in that because, you know, you put your money where your mouth is, right? You get involved. Yeah. You have to. If not me, who? If not now, when? And I and I say that to my to the viewers as well. If not you, who? And if not now, when? We have to come together to really make this happen because I thought that what they did with the marijuana laws on a federal level just recently was incredible. And not because of marijuana, but because the states bucked the federal government, which is what their job really is. They're supposed to be taking care of us. And the federal government had to move. They had to do something different because there was too much pressure. Do you think we have a chance if we do it from a state level to make a difference at the federal level? Has to be, has to be. And and the states are going to have to do what, you know, um, what they've, they're going to have to really push back, right? You, none of this, here's the thing about authoritarians and all that, right? They never give up power. They never, there's no logical argument, <laughs> right? You, you can't go to like the San Francisco city council and say, Raising the shoplifting limit to 950 was was a bad idea. Here's the outcome. They're they're just completely immune to looking, connecting cause and effect, right? Oh well, then we must rate. We should raise the limit higher, right? So they're just it's they're baffling. So I think if we listen, I've been lazy, I've been com, I've been complacent. I've allowed this to happen, right? And I realize now we got to push back. This means like you got to get down to the town, you know, your town offices and get involved in the politics, and it means you're going to have to actually you know, get, have hard conversations with people you live near and, and all of that, because none of this comes for free, right? You, you gotta, you gotta fight for it if you want it. So I think we've got a heck of a fight on our hands and, um, and, but it's so important because if we don't do this, let's what I know. I'm so foundational now, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That's what gives you prosperity, not more control, more administrative dictates, bigger rules, more, you know, IRS regulations. That that's not it. And we have people who are trying to strip from us what were our rights, not yes. privileges. Privileges are revocable and otherwise modifiable. A right is a right. Do we have parental rights? Do we have property rights? Do I even have the right to define what goes in my body, right? These yeah. used to be foundational rights and the, all that got stripped away since COVID and, and it's on, been on rocket fuel, but it's been going for a long time. So I see it now. Yeah, so we have to take those rights back. We have to take everything back. And I'm hoping that we can do it in a peaceful way. What do you think the chances of that are? 50-50. And it, and it changes daily. What do you think the chances are? I think it's easy if you just buy gold and silver and then you connect <laughs> with your local community. Um, I think we have a, a good chance. I... I you know, I'm, I'll go with 50, 50, I'll go with 50, 50 <laughs> at the moment because that's what I'm fighting for. And, and it yeah. has to be not just local, it has to be global and we can't just be fighting for ourselves. I mean, I might be older than you, but I mean, I I'm old. I'm going to be around, I think another 30 years. It's those that are left behind that, will have to deal with this, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, you know, our children as well. But um, yeah, I, I am all for creating a quiet revolution and that quiet revolution. I mean, I'm a child of the seventies. I remember when we shifted off and, and what Nixon said. I even remember Lyndon Johnson vowing, a president of the US vowing to manipulate the price of silver. And that policy has stayed in place until today, right? And that was with the 60s. So, you know, I remember all of that. I remember thinking Social Security is not going to be there for me by the time I reach there. Okay, maybe it was off a little bit, but they're certainly in a hole. 
Um, and I remember all the chaos and that loss of control and all the signs of collapse that you talked about and more. I mean, there isn't one little teeny weeny doubt that we are at the end of this life cycle. And this has lasted a long time. These transitions are hard. They're hard for everybody. Nobody is immune. I don't care what castle you live in. Nobody really comes out of this totally unscathed, but you can come out of it much better than you entered into it just by you know, I mean, it's a gift that they suppress the price of this stuff. It, it's really a gift. And people should look at it like that because neither one of these spot markets, gold or silver, have any level of true valuation for physical gold and silver, which is used globally throughout the entire system. That's why they've never gone to zero. And I have this. Okay. That wasn't good. But this hmm. is a rock that has gold and silver in it. You know? Oh, nice. You know what it takes to get the gold and silver out of this rock? A lot of work. A lot of work to pull it out of the ground. This, this is nothing. This is everything. And so I would love our currency to be labor for labor as it once was. I would love that. Yep then you are fairly paid for your labor. And they've been shifting uh, even the definition of money so that it flows into what their idea of money is. But do you want the central banks to have their finger on the economic button 24 seven so that if things aren't happening the way they want it to happen, they could just push a button and make it happen? Because that's what they're talking about. Very well said. Oh, that's so well said. You know, like like if they said, well, you know, we think a lot more people in Ukraine should die, so we're going to need every household to send us three ounces of gold. <laughs> then you're having a different conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, th this is a kind of a dangerous question. So maybe I shouldn't ask it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What do you think the chances of a gold confiscation in the U.S.? are because so many people say well that doesn't matter they took gold out of the money they're never going to confiscate it again i think manipulation is a form of confiscation but what do you think um i judge it fairly low today but if tonight saudi arabia said we are no longer accepting dollars for our oil we're only accepting gold on the barrel i would say that the the it would go the chances then would go very high um so, so it really depends. Right now, a little low, but but soon enough, pretty high. Um, I, it, it's very unfortunate, though. I did own gold once, but I had this. I was in a boating accident. Um, I was, you know, it's a big storm on a lake, Lynette. Uh, I don't even know which part of the lake we were on um, when it went overboard. So it happens. You know, this is <laughs> they're going to have a heck of a time getting it back. The gold, the gold community is pretty legendarily cranky about this stuff, and that's why I love being in America because. We got a lot of cranky people and we got a second amendment and I'd be like, good luck. Good luck with that. That's going to be a very expensive program to implement. Exactly. I mean, that's why they don't like gold or silver physical in your possession because they can't track it. They can't, you know, I give away a lot of gold and silver for when somebody's born, when somebody has a wedding, when my, my niece just graduated, things like that. Yep. Uh, I don't, and I don't remember. I've been doing it for so many years. Who can remember? Yep. Right. There's, yep. and, there's and they and they can try it like this. This is how they take your stocks and bonds. Click, 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 gone. Yep. Right. But they can't they can't do that with your physical assets much harder. They have to come knock on your door and it's a whole thing. Yep. Well, they did that in India, but India is much more tuned to wearing their wealth on their bodies because they've been through this before. This is not their first rodeo. We've been dumbed down in, in the U.S. We've been dumbed down a tremendous amount. And yeah. I think, you know, in many other parts of the world as well. I mean, I'm I'm looking. I, I absolutely love Australia. Australia gave me an epiphany when I was there the last time um, of how the importance of my message shifting to really 
talk a lot more about community and work to build that global community. But I'm looking at what they're doing with the biometrics and how they're just kind of squeezing the cash out of the system and what they did during COVID to their pup to their population. And it's you know, it, it's it's really scary because we've got all of these experiments that are going on all around the world. And I got news for you. Everybody's watching these different experiments, except for the public will go, well, that's over there. What happens when it happens here? Right? They, it's going to be They too always run their experiments, <laughs> right? They, they always run their experiments on islands. Remember when they did the first bail-in? Why Cyprus? Well, Cyprus. it's a little island. They could do a Petri dish on that thing and test it and see how it worked. Australia is a Petri dish for nudge units, behavioral psych operations, etc. Right? That's what it's turned into, unfortunately. Good people. I love the people. I hate I hate the government over there. But I could say that about a lot of places right now. That I could say that about here too. But I agree with you. The people are phenomenal. Best coffee I've ever had anywhere that I've ever gone in the world. I mean, I will mm -hmm. also say that the coffee was, I don't care whether you were like a little street vendor or a fancy restaurant, best coffee I've ever had anywhere. Um, Good to know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm lucky I'm getting to go again uh, to do an event in November. So uh, I'm looking forward to that and doing some more boots on the ground and, and talking to more people um, cause, because Australia really means a lot to me, you know, so... I care. And we have to do this globally. We can't just stay locally. We have to, you know, we have to live our life like this with our arms open then, you know, and just give whatever talents, whatever. This is, this is the global community. This is also the local community. And I feel so strongly. Um, it was one of the key lessons that I've had in my life is that we're all here to share the gifts that we have been given. And every single person on this planet, every mm -hmm. single one, I don't care who you are or what your circumstances are, you have a gift that you can share with others. And that's how we build the community. Agreed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Lynette, I am so happy that you're doing what you're doing in the world, sharing your gifts. And I'm, I'm very glad to hear you have, you know, your, your plan B all worked out. I would advise everybody listening, because a lot of people don't have their plan Bs worked out. And I think they have in their head, they'll work it out later when they really have to. Get on it. Yeah. Get, get on it. Get on that. Get the plan B. Even if it's on paper, you at least know what you, you think you're going to do. You know, it'd be very or, important. Or connect with somebody else, right? Which is part of the plan B. I mean, you know, up at our bug out location, we have people that are carpenters, plumbers, doctors, teachers, farmers, you know, learn some new skills. Uh, you can learn them on the go because a good, strong body and a nice, clear mind is also really, really helpful to have. You, you can learn new skills, but get out there, meet your neighbors, meet the people in your, in your, local area at the farmers markets at the community gardens at the meetups we are running out of time and while i think everybody thinks that they're going to know i mean i've had people now i know that was tongue in cheek the question you know lynette can mm -hmm. you tell me 45 minutes before the collapse so i can get ready that's kind of the mentality that people think isn't it it is it is but it's, it's, yeah, it's not going to work that way. This is going to happen relatively rapidly. And, and of course, when it's unfolding and that's no time, people get tunnel vision. We all do, right? If you're under pressure, you're, you get tunnel vision. I, I do all these, this pistol training, right? And, and we train and we train and we train and, and I like doing it because we go to competitions and it's fun, right? So, but the point is, is that when you're really under pressure, they say the general rule of thumb is you retain about half your training. So you could be really good on paper, but when you get into that difficult situation, you're about 50%. And that's if you're trained, right? So a lot of these people are thinking, well, you know, things get dicey. Then I'll figure it out. Yeah, with about half or less of your brain involved. <laughs> right. Well, the you problem is, is it's already dicey. Whether or not people can see how dicey it is, 
is not really relevant because it's not going to change anything. And and that's the piece that I want people to really hold on to and, and then start to make those choices that support their best interest and therefore the community's best interest because one person cannot do all of this alone. It, it's just not possible, period. Not possible. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. That's why, I mean, I've been working on my urban farm here since 2010 and my bug out location since 2021. And um, I'm more ready than anybody that, almost anybody that I know, I think you're at least equally as ready, if not more. Um, but we don't have the time to get ready so anymore. And that's why community has really risen to the top because I mean, I'm I'm planning a community and and planting food and all of that for that can sustain forty people. You know, I don't really have all forty people yet logged in, which means I got some room for more people. And it's so remote. I've had so many people say, "Oh well, don't say." This is one thing I love about you. I absolutely love how you are opening up your farm. Because I've had so many people say to me, oh, well, if they know that this is where you are, they're just going to come and take it. That's something that I can't really control another person. I can control myself and what I do. But quite honestly, if anybody actually made it to my remote, real remote location, I would invite them in because they've got some superpowers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm not kidding. It's very remote. It's very, very hard to get to, um, yeah. you know, and I would probably welcome them in to tell you the truth, because there's always room for there's always room for one more. I mean, we have to come together. We have to. Mm -hmm. I totally oh. agree with that. Thanks. I totally agree with that. And, and you know, I've, I've decided, you know, if people say, you know, pure preparation, it's probably not the smartest to let people know where you live and, and what you're up to. But I don't want to live that way. So um, I look at this in three stages. There's the before stage, and we're just about out of it. And then you enter the bottleneck phase, right? And then there's the after. Most people get stuck just thinking about the bottleneck, and I'm planning for the after stage, right? And there's two Me things I'm, I'm not going to do in the bottleneck. I'm not going to lose who I am and my sense of morality, right? Not up for debate. I take that with me to my grave. It's not for sale, never has been, right? Or, or it's going to be compromised. And the second thing is, I don't want to come in, come out of the bottleneck with the same dumb sets of skills that brought us into the thing in the first place. We have to do this differently, That's a good really point. differently, right? And so for that, the, it all comes together. And, and I don't think a lot of people spend time thinking about the after part, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's where, you know, who you assemble with and, and the, the culture you create is going to be the most important thing because that's durable. That outlives you. That, that carries on. Right. right. And it's really important to me. I'm, I'm very principled about this. I know. That's one of the things I had, have always admired about you. And I've been watching your work for, for, God, oh, I mean, a gazillion years. I think when you very <laughs> first started, I, honest to uh -huh. God. Um, would you like to tell people about the what, upcoming, your upcoming webinars? Absolutely. So um, like we have. Well, sure. I'd love to. Uh, first, we're, we're having a Protect Your Wealth webinar, and this is on June 15th, and it's a live webinar, but you can always watch a replay later if that doesn't work for you. Why live? Because people can then ask questions. So we're going to have uh, a variety of experts there just talking about, well, what can you do about this great taking? Is there anything you can do? And the answer is yes, right? There are yeah. some things you can do. And uh, it's not a one size fits all. So that's why it takes, you know, this is probably a six hour webinar. We're, we're thinking at this stage. So we'll have David Rogers Webb will be there. I'll be there. We have a portfolio expert there. We're going to talk about um, uh, how you can structure your portfolio for different things because there's different risk things. People need to understand the difference between margin accounts and cash accounts and wait, what happens at Treasury Direct things. We'll talk about all these. So that's June 15th and people can come to peakprosperity.com. That's my website, and there's a big tile there you could click, or if you are just want to type it in, it would be pprosperity.com slash event2, um, so that gets you right to that page. And then, and then as you, we mentioned, we have our in-person summit, uh, and that's in September this year, 
and that's a lot of fun. Um, we have to cap it at 400 people, but uh, they come from all over. We've had people usually fly in from all over the country and the world, and it's it's that analog resonance face to face talking to actual humans about the things you care about. So it, it's a really great time. Love that one. I, I definitely intend to, since you've now invited me. <laughs> I definitely intend to participate, if not this one, the next one. And I'll put it in the calendar so nothing can override it. Well, fantastic. would love to have you. You'd be very welcome and people would love having you there. So um, that would be just fantastic. So anytime, anytime. And, uh, may, you know, if, if uh, Istanbul isn't in the cards, just keep it in mind. Absolutely. We'll, we'll be making a decision on that actually pretty quickly. Although I don't like hearing something crazy is about to happen in August, September. Hmm. We'll I don't either. So let's hope it doesn't. All right. So let's hope it doesn't. Let's hope it doesn't. But let's be prepared for any eventuality if it does. And um, since you're going to be editing this and I know we've got a time, we got we got to go. But yep. you do know that I have a new business. I broke away and I've so started Zang Enterprises. So on YouTube, you can find all of my work at, and Twitter, both at the Lynette Zhang, Instagram and Facebook at Lynette Zhang. Uh, and we are democratizing buying gold and silver because we want everybody to have it. So it is a one ounce minimum. If you want one ounce of silver, you can have one ounce of silver. Uh, we know that you need more, but Whatever we can do to support your efforts, uh, everybody's efforts out there, uh, we are a different kind of gold and silver company for sure. We've got the strategy that we execute for everybody and that I'm revealing more and more of on YouTube because I want everybody in the world to create a strategy that works for them. We all need it. We all need it. You have to go up against these guys with a solid, sound strategy. Food water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. Got to get it done just as quickly as possible because we don't know when all those choices are going to be lost. Very well said, and, and best of luck with your new enterprise. And, uh, and we'll be sending as many people your way as we can. And I really hope we get to spend more time together in person at some point in the future. So, Lynette, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It's been, this has been great, and I hope to see you soon. Mm -hmm.